Great. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yeah, as Ian said, uh, I'm Tash Salmon. I'm the audience editor at uh, the I newspaper. Um, until about three months ago, I was our social media editor. So I am one of those. Uh, I did answer the call for one of those kind of new audience editor jobs that were out there. Um, it's very much we every newsroom has a different kind of title for that person in the, in in their organization um but so i'm specifically the audience editor i'm in charge of understanding our audiences we're very plugged in to kind of how we can grow our audience who they are what they want um and i work across our audience team basically um who are different section editors that deal with different parts of our website and our products um, so yeah, so this is basically going to be a bit of a crash course today. Um, due to uh, working for a company, I can't share any actual real kind of core data, but that is probably good for you. You're not going to be overwhelmed by numbers, um, which can be quite intense and is probably the least exciting part of my job. Um, so don't worry, there's not going to be loads of Excel docs that I drown in on a daily basis. Um, you get to kind of escape that. What I will try to do is kind of give you kind of practical insight. So tell you a bit about what I do um, as part of a news organization. And then maybe what you can do as individual journalists and students as well, because some things you kind of won't have access to unless you're in those positions. Um, so yeah, so we'll look at how to identify your audience, um, who they are, um, and find out a bit about kind of what that actually means. Uh, the importance of the data behind audience, um, kind of, so you found out who they are, why is that important? How can you use that? Um, and then also how to then connect with your audience. Um, I will touch a bit on examples within social media, just because that is kind of my um, area of biggest expertise. And I think it's also kind of the nicest visual representation of how to use audience data. Um, so yeah, so uh, we'll go through that. Any questions, stick them in the chat box. We'll come to them if Ian thinks he can slot them in or we'll come to them at the end. Um, but I'm hoping that kind of, if there's a question at the start, I might answer that kind of going through. So how to identify your audience. Um, what do we mean when we say audience? I'm gonna say it a lot. Um, please don't count how many times I say audience. It's gonna be one of those things where I'll say it so many times that it actually doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but when I say audience, I mean readers. So people that read articles from news websites, specifically for us at the Eye, it's people that read our newspaper, then read our articles on the site. Um, viewers, these are people that uh, would view uh, your images, your videos, if you're sharing video content, they're your viewers. Um, subscribers, these are people that either sign up to your newsletters or possibly if you've got a subscription based uh, website, that's who we mean. And it's basically anyone who interacts with journalism. So it's kind of that the people that interact with anything that you put out, any contact you make that's a form of journalism, that's who we're talking about. So let's look at the importance of data. Why is audience data important? Knowing who your audience are is important to the newsroom and not just the kind of specific audience editors like me. Um, it can, can inform you on what your readers actually like. So what do they like reading? Uh, what do they like viewing? Where should you share your content? How should you share your content? Um, when to share your content? Um, and even dictate kind of early in the creation process, what articles to actually commission. So it's kind of an influence on looking back and seeing what works and what doesn't work, but then also using that to then inform on decisions within the kind of editorial team on, on how you can actually inform the next time you do something on a similar topic. So where can you find audience data? So this is very much sums up my audience team at the eye. So we have newsletters, SEO, our app, our homepage and video. Um, and social, which I'll come to shortly. Um, but yeah, to find kind of audience data for these, they're usually inbuilt within the programs that we use to publish them. So within our newsletters, the system we use to push those out then has all the insights in how many people opened that email, how many people then open that email and click through to that, that main link there. And you can see how we do that. Georgia Chambers is our excellent newsletters editor um, and she'll then hyperlink through the newsletter. And we are hoping that people won't just open it and read it within their email emails they'll then click through to the website then we've got seo this is our search and, and kind of google based um expertise that we have um and this is really great for us um this is a large portion of our traffic um and this is where people come to us via google google discover um and really this is us trying to cater to them rather than find them them find us um and so if they're asking questions about when is sajid javid's um 
presser this evening, uh, we will have that article that says, when is it? We will answer that to them. Um, we find this audience data within Google Analytics. This is the main thing that we use, um, plus also Google Trends to then inform on how to make those articles. Um, our app and our homepage are kind of driven by our website. And again, that's an in-house website that's built just for us that I can't share with you, um, but that is kind of built specifically for us to see who is clicking on what, how much time they're spending on. It actually has this really cool feature where you can see where people tap on a screen and where they pause and actually look at something where they spend the longest time reading and, and scroll up and down. I absolutely love that part of our analytics and um, it's very nerdy of me. Um, and then finally video as well on here. Video is a big deal for us, not just on social media, but on site. So how many people are actually staying long enough in an article to watch a video relative to that piece play through um, and are they staying for the next play we usually when we produce original content on our video team that's what we usually queue up as the second play so after the video uh, which is related to that specific article and we always see it as a success if people stick around to them watch that original content that we've created um, so yeah it's basically knowing where to find the audience data re relative to all of these and how to use it um, unfortunately a lot of these can't really be accessed when you're a student or an individual journalist. Um, so yeah. Uh, so just a quick um, breakdown of um, into a bit more of these. So it's newsletters. I love newsletters so much. Um, the main priority for publishers when looking at newsletter data is, as I've mentioned, the open. So if you get that newsletter dropping into your inbox, are you clicking on it? Are you actually reading it? Um, are you then the next level of that is click throughs to the website? Are you actually clicking through to the website to read that piece? That kind of paragraph teaser that we've put in there has that kind of whet your appetite and you want to go through and read some more. Um, and then just like kind of followers on social media, subscribers and unscribers, what's the rate of people signing up to those newsletters? Um, and what's the rate of people dropping off? Why might they have dropped off? Is that something that we need to change? Um, also kind of depending on the newsletter software you use, you can also see more about the people behind that audience, not just how they act on your product, but actually who they are. So um, where they live and, and age range and things like that. Um, so yeah, a bit more on our website and homepage. Um, we kind of view our homepage as like the shop window for all our content. Um, the main priorities of it really are promoting the best content we've got, keeping people on the website. How do we get them from the homepage to then clicking through to a piece and going to view something else on the site? Um, and we're a news website. The main priority for our homepage is to stay up to date and be as up to date as possible. Um, this is not our homepage right now. This is from a couple of days ago. It's more up to date right now, I promise. Um, so yeah, and then SEO um, with social and newsletters, uh, it's obviously with we're kind of um, delivering our content to them with search. It's often catering to what people are already looking for. So we use Google Trends to just determine what people are searching for that day, what questions they want answering, how can we inform on that and give an expert kind of explain a voice on that. Um, also, in terms of Google Discover, it's kind of the approach is kind of similar to landing on like Facebook or um, like the Discover tab on Twitter. If we land on Google Discover, um, that's really great for us. Um, and that's something we can kind of aim for as well. But so the final part of our audience team that I'm going to focus slightly more on is social media. Um, it's something that I love. I'm very passionate about. Please do go watch my Instagram masterclass. Some of it is slightly out of date because, you know, Instagram's constantly changing, but a lot of the kind of tips and tricks are still applicable um, and we're still using them on our Instagram page as well, which you should go follow the eye paper. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of social media audience as well, this is probably more transferable for you as an individual journalist. So whether you manage your own professional journalism page um, or you manage a smaller one that's a student publication. Um, and yeah, so it's probably easier and more transferable, which is why I've slightly more focused on social media audience. So the goals for social media editors are to grow and maintain audiences within the, their platforms. They then want those audiences to engage with the content. They want those comments, those likes. And then they also want to drive the traffic to the website. Now, I found as a social media editor myself and now as an audience editor that actually you can use the first two to drive traffic to the website. 
Um, and what this means is if you identify that audience that is within those platforms, who are your followers? Who are your likers? Who are the people that regularly comment? Who are the people that regularly share your posts? Once you identify who they are, you can, you can cater to what they want. Um, and ultimately that means that they'll then click through to the website. So how do you find audience data within social? So really helpfully, there's a, a lot of ways to find uh, audience data within social media platforms. Um, it used to be very, very primitive, very, very hard. I think about, um, so I've been in social media for about six years now. And when I first started, it was like, download this Excel doc from Facebook and try and make sense of days and days of data. <laughs> and it was intense. Um, and you can still do that, but actually their kind of analytics dashboard is so much more helpful now. And it will just be like green arrow up, red arrow down um, in the most simplest form. So do check it out if you do have access to any of the business tools on social media platforms. Um, Twitter has slightly retracted how much data it allows people to see. Um, which is quite annoying, um, but it, there's a kind of enough there to kind of gauge what's going on. I would say Facebook and Instagram are probably the most helpful. TikTok as well um, has the best kind of video insights, I'd say, um, kind of maybe second down from Facebook, they're, or they're on par really, um, but do have kind of a look through um, and there might be things in there that surprise you. Um, so what I would, I would say is if you have access to like business tools, um, and you can, you've got content that you've already put out there, have a scroll through these, see what actually people like, because it might not be what you think. Um, the final tool I just wanted to flag is CrowdTangle. Um, this is a actually a Facebook product, um, and it is so useful, and I kind of make sure that all the journalists in my newsroom use it. Use it. I could not live without it. Um, it's basically a Google extension that you can click on, um, and what that does is it can give you kind of the social share data of posts. So this box on the right hand side, um, that was a piece that we shared a couple of weeks ago about the HDV crisis. Um, and as you can see, um, that source down here where it's been shared on the iPaper Facebook page, we can see the interactions there. We can also see it was shared on a petrol tankers drivers forum. So that's great that it's actually reaching the people that we're writing about and you can see that and that's great. And you can also toggle between these tabs. So see where it was shared on Twitter, see where it was shared on Reddit and then also Instagram. Um, it also allows you to compare between uh, different publications, different websites, um, anything really that has that audience data there, you can kind of look and compare. Obviously, Daily Mail is the monster here um, and everything else kind of pales in comparison. Um, but it is kind of good to see where people are at if you're having a bad day on social and no one's clicking on anything, just double check that it's not just you and it might actually be happening to everyone else and you can kind of go, oh, okay, that's, that's not me. It's something that's wrong with the platform. Um, unfortunately, this isn't available to students. It's very much a newsroom based product. Um, but if you are freelancing in a newsroom, um, if you work in a newsroom, um, do get in touch with your social media editor or your audience editor and see if they are, if they do have a CrowdTangle account. Um, you can then add journalists within that newsroom to that CrowdTangle account and you have plenty of access to that. Um, I could do a whole presentation like this about CrowdTangle, but they, they, they're not paying me for it, so I won't. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's move on to a bit more about social media and audience. Who is your audience? Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the good thing is that platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram provide so much data about who your followers are. You can find out who they are, how old they are, where they're from, um, what do they like clicking on, which is really important, and then what do they like reacting to and commenting on. And when I talk about that, I mean kind of engagement and also shares. Um, so I'm going to look a bit at our Facebook page and how we've used one aspect of our audience data to inform on strategy. Um, so on our Facebook page, we have slightly more men than women following us. Um, and the largest kind of age group of men and women that follow us are aged 25 to 44, which is not a shock really. Uh, we're a publication that's 10 years old, almost 11 years old. Um, so we've not been around that long. And a lot of the people that follow us on Facebook specifically are kind of about my age, kind of into their like late twenties, early thirties. 
um, they probably had the eye paper sitting up at their freshers fairs at uni 10 years ago um, and that's where they all follow us on Facebook and they've kind of followed us through it's kind of the new newspaper that they were exposed to as adults. Then there's also the other factor that we were part of the independent and a lot of the independent readers who were kind of mid 30s 10 years ago um, kind of jump ship and came to the eye instead of the independent um, and that's kind of not really a shock to see that our main social media audience is aged between 25 to kind of 45 that's kind of the core people who have been with us from start till finish um, our newspaper audience in contrast is slightly older um, I should know from the top of my head but it's probably kind of 45 plus um, and that does, does still translate to some of our social media platforms um, I'm very pleased to say that our Instagram audience is actually 30 and under, which um, is a really great achievement for us. Um, and we're really trying to hit that younger audience, especially as that becomes a new and emerging platform for news. Um, so anyway, these people, what do they like? They like politics, uh, they like consumer and product news. So what's the late, who's the latest fast food restaurant um, that's producing a vegan burger? Um, what what new thing is Asda bringing out that's sustainable? Like what else are they putting in like refillable tubs? Um, also crime, really into crime. And then also kind of gone from kind of slightly highbrow to lowbrow to like television and celebrity news. They really enjoy that. Um, in contrast to this, so that's looking at that, that is um, all the people that click through to our pieces. They're the ones that end up on our website. That's the highest number of clicks we get. However, if we're looking at engagement, the most people, the people most likely to comment, like, or share are women aged 65 plus and men between 45 to 64. So that older readership that we've got on social media, they're more likely to comment on stuff, whereas that younger audience are more likely to click. Um, therefore, in the last year or so, we've had viral pieces on the menopause, uh, waspy women, they're the women that have kind of been done over by the new retirement plans, and then the, the royal family, especially um, kind of female members of the royal family stories around them. So there's kind of like a contrasting thing there, whereas that kind of core larger audience is really into politics, really into news and crime, and then a kind of a smaller, slightly more dedicated audience, more loyal, are really into kind of um, issues around their age and older. So it's kind of, we looked at that and we're like, right, well, what do we do with this? So now we look at using audience data. Um, so our strategy with this would be to keep posting those pieces that we know interest that largest audience. Uh, this means that we continue to have a general ticking over of really well clicked pieces and this maintains the page. So there's kind of a consistency with posting those politics, consumer news, TV and, and celebrity news pieces. Um, we then also really want to take advantage of this smaller, more engaged um, audience. And so what we do is we post fewer pieces relating to them um, because they're smaller and more concentrated, we can identify them as a loyal audience. Um, so we'd still post pieces that relate to them, but we'd make sure they were the strongest pieces possible. So we wouldn't want to flood with that content. Um, this means that these pieces may not perform as well consistently. We may have a piece that does not really that great, but then the next time we post something related to it, it does amazingly well, which is what we call overperforming um, and could lead to something going viral. So um, it's it's kind of striking that balance really and it is those pieces that really hit that loyal audience that we see then taking off and hitting a million and hitting two million um, rather than just the everyday every kind of um, uh, general posts of hitting like tens of thousands. I hope that makes sense. Um, other small behaviours um, I've identified from our social audience, which I find quite interesting, um, is that our articles about sex do absolutely no engagement. Um, I'll get um, I'll get like our um, list through of what's our top performing post from a week or a month. And I'll look at the post itself and be like, but nobody's liked this. Nobody's commented on this. This is so strange. Um, but actually a thousand people have clicked through to it in about five minutes, um, which is really interesting. And part of this like role that does interest me is the kind of human behavior behind it. Um, and the, the main way we've seen this is our really cool writer, Dr. Kate Lister, at Whores of Your on Twitter, if you want to follow, she's really cool. She does really cool historical pieces about sex and, um, and modern pieces as well. And what we find is that people see these articles and they're like, oh, I really want to read that. It's kind of that not something for work feel. 
but they don't want people to know that they're reading it um, just in case it says something negative about them. So they'll click on it um, probably slightly quick enough so no one can see behind them if they're in an office. Um, but they also don't want to comment on it because that could then pull that piece about vegans being better lovers to their main feed and then their Nancy's and nobody wants that. Um, I mean, she'd probably be more annoyed that they were vegans, but you know, like it's, it's just that thing where they don't, it's, they don't want to be seen to be clicking on it. Um, and that's been quite a fun thing to identify because on the surface, other editors would be like, well, that's done nothing. That's not actually got any engagements. No one's liked it. And it's like, well, actually like 10,000 people have actually clicked on that. They've just not wanted to let anybody else know. Um, so yeah, that's something that's been really interesting and we've consistently seen with our audience. Um, so yeah, they're quite highbrow and they're quite prudish, <laughs> which is just, yeah, interesting to see. Um, so yeah, another big thing that kind of is instrumental to uh, being an audience editor, a social media editor, um, is adapting to platform changes. Um, I am constantly asked, what about the algorithm? All the time. Um, and honestly, we just wait to see what happens. Um, and we kind of go from there, basically. Um, so platform changes. Uh, so these are some changes that we've had in the last couple of months um, that have impacted us. Um, so Instagram announced that it was video first. Uh, Instagram also got rid of story swipe up links. Um, Twitter is shifting its focus to moments slightly more, which means that news organizations are doing that as well. Um, and we also saw quite a big uh, Google algorithm shift. Um, so. I'll kind of have a little bit of a look at these. In terms of the Google algorithm shift, just to quickly touch on that, um, these happen quite a bit. Google's actually quite nice in that they let people know, and there's a lot of kind of steering groups around um, SEO editors that, where different SEO editors from different publications will meet up. Um, and Google kind of gave the heads up for this one that it was the, um, the core web vital metrics that would be impacted by this. And that's basically, um, the, the site speed basically um, and it was if your site speed isn't fast enough you're going to be hit by this next algorithm change good luck um, <laughs> you're basically then just left to kind of deal with it and try and figure out ways to sort it out um, and this is kind of why it's good to be really plugged into your audience and know who they are and know that okay well every time we have um, search pieces around um, HGV uh, job applications um, that does really well for us every time we have uh, search pieces around uh, meteors they do really well as well um, and actually it's making sure that there's no um, technicality ships within those pieces that are going to kind of harm us um, that's google which is kind of um, not as exciting or creative to adapt to don't tell my SEO editor, I said that. Um, but looking at um, Instagram, this is kind of a more visual way to see how we adapt to stuff. So um, we were really, really hit by the uh, swipe up links feature. We'd kind of built this audience on our Instagram page um, of people um, coming back to us for our repetitive series using that swipe up link. Um, and they were then going straight through to our website. We were seeing like growing success for that. And that's really massively grown for us in the last year. Um, within a month that had been halved um, just because of how um, the, it, the literal function of how you use your phone had completely changed. Um, and we did some trials and testing and we discovered that actually having a call to action on our Instagram stories that says, tap the link to read more, it, that meant that people clicked that sticker um, rather than being able to swipe up. Um, it basically meant that we had to completely retrain our audience in how to use the platform. Um, and that was something that we needed to do immediately. It's the sort of thing, kind of these adaptions to the platform changes, you can kind of wait for your audience to catch up, but a lot of the time you can't really afford that. As a news publisher, you kind of have that drop off and you need to catch up. Um, so we yeah, literally had to retrain people on how to use Instagram um, and it was almost instant. It went from that kind of 50% drop off to back up to 75 um, in terms of people clicking through. Um, 
and that's a selection of some of our Instagram stories that we have up going every week um and yeah that that really helped us so it's kind of and that was very much nobody told us to do that it was very much myself and our social team um sitting around thinking why isn't this working what do we know people do and want and actually when the swipe up function came in all news publishers used to have swipe up for more swipe up for more um actually built into the product into the stories that they build for instagram um and then they just didn't need to do that anymore because everybody knew that they had to swipe up to read it um there was also then instagram introduced the little see more thing um so yeah so we realized that actually we needed to implement that and make that change so it's all about kind of adaption and, and changing um as you go um, so yeah, so what should you do if a platform changes, be led by the data, what is and isn't working, um, how actually could this work to your advantage? Um, it is quite nice actually that we don't have to have the link at the bottom, we can kind of change our designs, like move that link around the image um, and change things up a bit. Um, and could it actually mean that you repurpose and reformat other content um, in a different way? Um, so we've actually found, so going back to these challenges that we've had, um, the fact that Instagram announced it was kind of going video first. Facebook did this about four or five years ago um, and everyone panicked, um, but everyone responded in kind. They, they grew larger video teams, social media journalists trained up in video production, um, and we found ways of sharing those kind of site videos in a more social way. Um, and then suddenly your Facebook feed was literally just videos. Um, and we've looked at doing this for Instagram and actually we've seen some success of it. Um, we've started doing reels. We don't have a TikTok yet, um, but we started doing reels and it's actually like a really fun way to still maintain telling the news, but in an engaging way. Um, and we have seen kind of an instant uptick in people engaging with those videos and viewing them. Um, and then that's supporting the growth of that page. And then ultimately then people, more people going back to our website. Um, so yeah, so I would say always try new things. I'm so, I'm constantly wanting to adapt and refresh stuff because I think things get old so quickly, especially on social media, that it's always worth, even if it's a slight tweak every week, if you've got a weekly series going out on your um, Twitter account or on your Instagram or your Facebook, just tweak it every week and see if that makes it work better. If it doesn't, change it back. Um, but yeah, just really adapt and, and see what works and doesn't. Don't be afraid to fail because next time it might help you succeed. I'm just going to have some water. Um, so brand versus audience. Um, so what do you do if the people within your audience don't love what you publish? Um, so basically the I, um, we're very well known for our political coverage. We have some incredible political journalists that work for us. Um, am I still slightly starstruck when I meet a couple of them? Yes, I am. Um, and it is very much what we're known for. It isn't necessarily the type of content that can go on every social media platform, that can go in every kind of newsletter, um, and it might not be clicked on by everyone. Um, but how do we make that work? And it's, it really is a balancing act. So on platforms such as Instagram, a post about Boris Johnson isn't really going to get that many likes unless it was on the Conservative Party page. Um, also, if we're publishing news, the fact that there could be a new lockdown, please no. Um, we're going to put that on Instagram. That's not a likable post. No one's going to like that. Um, and this is very much the kind of behaviour that informed Facebook's use of interactions so you know they introduced the like love heart the care uh, the laugh on instagram it's still very much like um and that drives a lot of the content that goes out there so what do you do what have i well this is what i've done the last couple of years um if you want to still grow that right audience so if you want to grow an audience but it want you want it to be the one you actually want you want an actual reader not just somebody who likes that specific post you kind of need to stick to your brand so you do need to take the hit on the pieces not doing as well um and find different ways to make the pieces that don't do as well uh, make them work either pre or post publication um and then also just intersperse that with the easy wins so if there is the latest kind of snow leopard uh cub emerging for the first time at glasgow zoo 
get it up on your Instagram, you know, you're going to get loads of likes on it. Um, but balance that out with kind of the latest news and the things that are important to your brand and your editors and what you're known for. Um, so yeah, some recent examples here, we had a real go up of Boris Johnson's uh, conference speech, um, all of his alliteration and uh, long words that he included. Um, we ended up getting a few thousand views on it, but again, not so many likes, quite a few comments, some of them not complimentary, some of them I had to delete. Um, and then also, but then in comparison to that, we know our um, opinion pieces do incredibly well on Instagram. People really like those voices um, and this piece did really well. We also have our regular Saturday post that goes out, which is our good news piece. Um, and this is very much something that we've tailored for Instagram and does really recurringly well. Um, and you can still be a news website and still do well on Instagram with stuff like this. So give them the good news, give them the news to like. Um, but obviously, of course, not all news is good. And it's just it is just a balancing act. And sometimes things will absolutely crash and burn sometimes they'll fly and you'll be like I can't believe that happened um so yeah it is about kind of striking that that balance between them um so just a quick kind of recap of that part of my my chat so find out who your audience are find out what they like and really just have a think about are they the audience that you want um, so it's kind of getting all that data finding out who they are finding out what what data actually matters like is if is fifty percent of your audience actually from a country that you don't talk about? Um, is that actually something you want? Could that be a site glitch and harmful to your company if all of your followers are actually from a different country and all you produce is UK news? Could you benefit from that? Could you actually produce content on that country and then boost your presence on that platform? Um, also making sure you're tailoring to all aspects, as I mentioned, not just the people that click through to your pieces, but also the people that engage with them. Um, so maintaining those consistent pieces, but then also really kind of hitting home and trying to get those viral pieces from those loyal audiences that do um, comment, like and share. Great. So posting. This is another thing I get asked all the time. When do I post? What do I post? Help me, please. Um, and again, the, my only answer is look at the data. What does your audience want? Um, so really with posting, like we, we now have an idea of what your audience wants. So you've had a look at who your audience are, what they like, but when should you post? My three kind of approaches to this are generally when the content is most relevant, uh, when your audience is most active um, and when you have told your audience you will be posting or publishing something. Um, there's some examples in here that are largely social media, but this is transferable across kind of other areas. Um, and I can, I'm happy to answer specific kind of area questions later on if you guys wanted to flag anything. Um, but I do think it is transferable and I am just kind of giving you what I've done and kind of how helpful that is. Great, so when, is, when your, your content sorry, is most relevant. Um, breaking news. Um, so obviously breaking news happens, um, you wanna post that content kind of as soon as possible. This is like um, something is happening as soon as it happens, let's get the latest news up. Your audience will then be looking for that. They want to either find you and you have published that content or you need to get that content to them. And that's when you need to post that breaking news. Um, I have kind of grown up in journalism in breaking news environments. So if it's not up within a few minutes, um, I get very stressed out. Um, and it's like, for me, that's not right. It needs to be up as soon as possible. Um, and beating as many other publications is kind of great for us. That's not really um, our approach at the iPaper. We're very much more a measured approach to news. Um, and more focused on kind of that expert analysis um, as well. Um, but yeah, so breaking news, that's when your content is most relevant. That's when you need to get it out there. Um, another time your content is most relevant is in with events and campaigns. So for example, World Mental Health Day, um, it's obviously Black History Month as well at the moment, um, and making sure that you've got a lot of content behind those points. 
um, and planning ahead and making sure you're getting them in relation to them. And even down to the fact of using that hashtag um, and jumping on that and making sure that you're including that whenever you share those pieces of content. Um, and that's a really important part of when you're jumping on those. Um, another time your content is most relevant is when it's trending, um, even if it's already happened or it's a past event um, and you want to kind of jump in and, and take advantage of that. Again, that kind of using those hashtags, seeing what's trending on Twitter, also looking on Google, what's trending in Google Trends. Um, your content is relevant then because you can reshare it or you can then kind of create that content and then share it to kind of meet those trends. Um, this is something that I always say to our journalists. Um, I, if I remember, I'll drop a journalist a line and go, oh, well, have you seen that this is the, um, there's an appeal today about that court case you covered. It might be good for you to cover, to repost that feature that you wrote. And they're like, oh yeah, that would be good. I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, do that. Um, and it's kind of, this, it, there's so many things that you can jump on, like, especially like features writers, you write about so many vast things, it's gonna come up in kind of the basic conversations on the internet at some point during the year. Set it up. If you know that there's specific days that it will come up again in the calendar, schedule tweets, sit down. If you've got an afternoon and you've written all these amazing features, um, schedule it out on the days that they'll be most relevant. If you've written a feature about Christmas, schedule it to go out probably Boxing Day morning, because no one's really going to be on their phones on Christmas Day. They'll be there hungover scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter on Boxing Day morning. Oh, there's that feature. That feature is really interesting. I'll read that or if it's pre-Christmas. Um, but just have a think about your article isn't necessarily just relevant to that specific time it, when it is first published. Um, it is relevant kind of continuously. Um, you can also return its relevance by in how you post about it, like give it some con context, be that voice, that authority and that voice behind it. Um, this is something that I say regularly to our journalists, I that I'm like we're our social media team aren't just here to kind of push your content out. You need to do it as well. You need to run your own social media campaigns um, and really you can do that by owning that patch that coverage that you do um, and in doing that you can then get those returning followers those returning readers um, and even get new sources for um, upcoming articles as well it's just a really good way to kind of create that social presence um, and finally when your content is most relevant another aspect of it, it this is literally just hyperlinks in your articles they're so so key to driving people, keeping people on your website. If you're posting stuff on your blog or if you work for a news organization, um, you can link them straight through to past articles that you've written about that specific topic and something that relates to it. And it also keeps them within the website, which we love. Um, and it's really, really effective. Um, another, another thing with this, links within articles, as well as doing threads, you could just do a content thread. Here's everything I've just written about this. Um, we had a really cool investigation um, kind of pay off last week, actually. Uh, one of our reporters was looking into why so many people were having positive lateral flow tests um, and then doing a PCR test and it was coming back negative. And he kind of had a few tip offs about it and was like, this is quite strange. Looked into a bit more. It started being that it was causing chaos in schools. People were ill, but their PCR test was telling them that they weren't. Um, and ultimately, two weeks later, a, a PCR testing centre was um, kind of put on hold. All, all work was stopped in Wolverhampton, I think, or Northampton, I can't remember, in the Midlands. Um, and it was because they discovered that there was an error at this testing lab, which we discovered within our journalism. Um, we then put all that content together, did it out as a big kind of thread. Um, and then that was the package. It was like, this has just happened. This um, Wolverhampton testing center has just been shut down. Here's everything that we've done in the lead up to this. Just give your audience that, that context to the piece. It's so interesting in terms of how you get there. Like it's not just about that specific news story. It's about the news stories behind it as well. Um, and really kind of jump on that and take advantage of that, whether it's from a main Twitter account that I did it from or from your own as well. Don't be afraid to kind of 
shout about it you you are your own cheerleader really kind of push your content um and uh yeah get it out there um so another time to post is when your audience is most active so website traffic kind of will fluctuate during the day um and it goes up and down um if there was a graph it would look probably very similar for all websites there'd be obviously be degrees in actual volume of traffic um but i would say it would look very similar in terms of where the peaks are where the troughs are and where it goes up and down again um, and it does follow a pattern of behavior probably less so now in terms of how ingrained in our lives social media is um, and that just the fact that everyone's on it all the time uh, when I first started working in social media it was very much um, oh I'm on my lunch break I'm going to read this whereas people are checking in constantly and they probably have it open all the time on their phones anyway um, but there are those kind of peaks so the commute to work people are on their phones their lunch break they're kind of taking a break from the other screen they're on to go to another screen to look at something else and um, the commute home again scrolling through phones sitting on the train stuck in traffic uh don't go on your phone when you're driving um and also when the kids have gone to bed that's another kind of peak time so kind of post 9 p.m um also just if you don't have kids i always suddenly find myself just in bed scrolling through my phone and that's that's another peak time when we've really seen pick up um, and this is very much characteristic of social media, also website, just on websites generally as well. Um, interestingly, not to give people PTSD with that picture of Boris at the podium, um, but interestingly, we did see this slightly change during the pandemic. Um, and actually, because people were working from home, we lost the commuter traffic. Um, there was obviously still people checking in before they went about their days. Um, and there obviously still were people working, but less so um, on those strict patterns. So actually people were coming to us slightly later in the morning um, and there was obviously wasn't that kind of compute, commute home. Um, and we saw probably the biggest drop off in terms of the commute home, but actually there was a bigger shift to other behavior. Um, so daily COVID briefings, that became a massive influx of traffic for us. People knew, so from like quarter to five until half past five, people wanted to know what was happening with the COVID briefing. No one wanted to watch them anymore. They just wanted to be told what was happening. So we would see a huge influx of people to the website, clicking on our social media posts about that briefing and what had happened. Because I think after about 10, some of my friends were just like, I can't watch it anymore. And I was like, I have to watch this every day. <laughs> Um, so it was interesting to just see how that changed behavior as well. Um, also, remember when we were only allowed one thing of exercise a day, that massively impacted because it was kind of the only time people were away from their screens. And my kind of theory behind it is that people went on these lunchtime walks and actually they didn't want to look at their phones. They just wanted to be in nature. Um, which I think was a big thing of 2020 um, and didn't actually want to be looking at articles that we were pushing out and then would come back to their desks kind of after lunch um, and we're looking through stuff. The, since working in social media there was always a dead time between two and kind of half past four where we'd see a, a big drop off in traffic and um, that very much changed that became kind of a busy time and the actual lunch lunch time um, dropped off a bit so yeah that was that was interesting to see when it first started happening I was like why is this not doing well it's gone up at 12 o'clock <laughs> um, and then it was kind of realizing that so many things about like human behavior just does really impact it um, and then another time that's best to post is when you've told your audience you're going to post something, obviously. Um, so if your newsletter goes out every day at lunchtime, um, send it out every day at lunchtime because um, that's when they're expecting it. This builds habit and recognition. It also creates loyalty um, and repetition in posting at those specific times or specific days of the week. Um, can be really, really effective and can also be tailored to different platforms. Um, so we've got quite a few different newsletters at the Eye and um, we have our, our Eye, our main one, that's that kind of like our daily briefing. Um, we shifted that, that used to go out in the evening, we shifted that to midday and we told our subscribers, people like, 
it's changing, please still click through it at midday. And because we repeatedly told them and we'd already built that loyal following from them, they all, they all still were receptive of it. They still clicked through at that time. Um, and that's because we built that kind of recognition among them. Um, I would, if I could see everyone, I'd kind of say who here listens to a podcast. Um, I'm sure most of you do. I'm sure a lot of you did last year. Um, but you know your favourite podcast, if that's a weekly podcast, you know exactly what day that comes out. You know exactly what time that's landing you know okay well that's coming out at midday on Thursday well I can't actually listen to it then oh, I can listen to it in the evening when I'm walking the dog something like that that's that's you built you had a habit put into you by a company um, and you're acting on that and that's what we want to do um, as audience editors as social media editors, as newsletter editors to build those habits among people um, this is something I've done to build our Instagram page and our Instagram stories. Um, so we have a series called How I Manage My Money um, and it goes up every week and it's great because everybody's so nosy and they just want to know how much people earn and what they spend it on. Um, spoiler, people that earn more get so much hatred, <laughs> but actually people click on it way more um, and get so angry at why we're kind of interviewing these people that earn so much. And it's like, well, stop reading what they, they earn and spend it on. Um, but yeah, so that's a really big kind of series for us. And it's it's really interesting. Um, and we now put, we post that every Wednesday on our Instagram account. Um, we now have people kind of looking out for it. We actually changed the day about six months ago. We went from a Tuesday to a Wednesday. Um, which was, we were slightly worried about that because we built up such a good audience from our Tuesday posting and actually it was transferable. We had a couple of DMs kind of saying, oh, is how much money going up today? Um, which got me very excited that people actually were messaging about it. Um, but yeah, it's all about building that habit and that creates loyalty. And that's that loyal audience that I was kind of referring to when I mentioned about the Facebook page. They're the ones that will then share it, the, the, whose friends will then share it, who will then make that kind of post go viral, get those thousands of clicks. Um, and yeah, just kind of consistency is so key um, in terms of posting times um, and in terms of what you're posting. So really building up that, that recognition. Um, and not just for those series in particular, but as a brand itself. Um, the Eye is a relatively new newspaper. Um, we're not as well known. Uh, I still probably once a month have to say we're not the independent, um, but we're getting there and our brand is growing as our following does. And so does our loyal audience as well. So, yeah, it's just really interesting to see. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to do a bit. That's very much kind of how to on like the nitty gritty of audience. And when you've got the data, what you can do with it. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit more on, on kind of the social media side of stuff um, as it is kind of has been my bag for so long um, and it's something that I think can definitely feed into understanding your audience more. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk, this is something as well that I work with our journalists individually on, so it's definitely something that is helpful for individual journalists, not just news organisations as a whole. Um, so, and obviously I had to have a Shit's Creek gif in here somewhere. <laughs> I couldn't not. Um, so yeah, so connecting with the audience. Um, you've discovered what your readers want, but how do you make sure that they kind of interact every time? So day to day, I talk to our journalists about optimizing their content for social. Um, and this is in terms of before they post something and then also afterwards, like after it's published, it isn't just then it's out there, let's just leave it. Um, you still kind of need to have that ownership around it, which is what I mentioned earlier about them all using their own kind of Twitter accounts um, and that sort of thing. Um, so actually in terms of social, the presentation of a piece is really important. Um, and we want to try and kind of stir feelings from our audience um, as well as kind of interest them and intrigue them. So we want people to see something, say they're scrolling through their Facebook feed, and um, that's still our biggest referrer of traffic um, on our social channels. Um, and we want them to go, oh, this is me, or oh, I empathize with this, or oh, actually this helps me tell my story. I'm going to jump in the comments and I'm going to reply and tell my side of it and actually then engage with Susan from 
Manchester who said this and, and reply to hers. Um, another thing we could stir is, oh, this makes me laugh. I learned something. Um, also, the kind of lesser one that we actually want to do is, oh, this makes me angry or I'm outraged. But it's probably the biggest reaction we get. We just don't want to. Well, I personally wouldn't want to actively um, stir anger from our readers because it's kind of a negative feel. Um, and we just kind of don't really want to do that to our audience. We want to kind of keep them on side and them to keep coming back to us and not have a negative experience. Um, so think about to think about when you're connecting with your audience, what works. So images, images are such a big deal. If it's a rubbish image, nobody's going to want to click on it. Um, headlines, and um, this is different depending on uh, website or news organization, um, but you can have specific headlines for specific platforms. We have a social headline, then we have a search headline and, and one for our website as well. Um, one thing to think about as well is like video intros. Video intros are need to be as grabby as just a standalone headline. Um, this is from a video that we released this week about five things you can do to help climate change with what you eat. Um, to fight climate change, sorry, not help climate change. Um, and <laughs> don't do that. Um, and it was just kind of a grabby, we're getting that headline in there, we're getting people interested, um, and then hopefully getting them to either watch the video or click through and read the feature about it. Another thing, think about kind of engagement. Why would somebody like this? Why would somebody comment on this? Why would they share, share this? So kind of going back to what I said about those stories about sex that people are not going to share, they're not going to comment about. Um, if you actually want to get a response on those pieces, is there a way that you can do it? Is there a way that you could do it on Instagram and say, send us a DM or reply to our question rather than putting it on a public forum and everyone can see their responses? Um, maybe put a call out and say, uh, DM us if you have something you want to contribute on this. Um, so yes, yeah, so always have that kind of level of sensitivity to what the topic is um, and how you can get your audience to kind of interact with you on that. Um, so another kind of big aspect of connecting with the audience that I'm quite hot on with our journalists um, is images. So. People have, like how I was saying about Instagram stories, how we had to retrain our audience to click that new link sticker uh, and not swipe up. People have been trained to double tap on an image to like it. Um, I guarantee that when people scroll through Twitter, they click on that card that comes with the link. They never click on the link itself, even though that's still in the tweet. They're more likely to click on that Twitter card that shows up or the image. Um, therefore, that featured image can directly turn into clicks for your website and you wanna make sure that's engaging. Um, just in general, you wanna show and tell what your story is about, is about, sorry, and find ways to make that emotive. So stirring those feelings, as I mentioned, how can you do that with that image? Um, this is when people will not only like or click it, but then share it. And that's a, a big part as well. Um, so this example here on the right-hand side is a piece that we had run on the iPaper. Um, it was about this lady who sadly lost her dream job um, and she couldn't afford um, her DBS check on universal credit. We have a lot of these stories. Um, we do a lot of kind of investigations into universal credit and people that are struggling on it. Um, and the original image was the little inset that we've got there. So this lady had provided it. It's obviously a very nice picture that she's taken of herself. It's definitely got an Instagram filter on it, bless her. We've all been there. Um, and unfortunately, because that was a portrait image that had cropped quite badly on her forehead. And so just didn't really say anything about her or her story. Um, we th I then went to the reporter and said, look, this is a really good piece. You've spent a lot of time on this. It's a really emotional interview that you've done. Um, but the image just isn't great. Have you got any more? Um, and she said, oh, yeah, I've got a really nice one of her and her kids. And I was like, OK, <laughs> let's do that one. Um, so we swapped that in. Um, and instantly you've got an emotive piece there. You've got this woman who's talking about her struggles with universal credit. Um, she's lost her dream job. And actually that's her family and that could be anyone's family. And that's when you get people commenting on, oh, my daughter had exactly the same thing or God forbid this would happen to my grandchildren. Um, and instantly you're connecting with your audience. 
and it is about kind of making the most of your piece and it's, it, if it's a good and a strong piece how do you then heighten that um, and that's something that I talk to our journalists a lot about is really kind of pushing that so once it's gone live but have you kind of put it live in the best way possible um, and then a the final thing I think final I'm not sure um, on engagement um, so what is engagement so I've talked a lot about this but kind of likes comments and shares are really important just within kind of not just social media but newsletters as well um within our app or sending in letters to the paper like it's something that's kind of as old as newspaper themselves like letters within papers that was the original engagement um i would say if you ever pick up a paper always read the letters pages they are hilarious they're shocking um my nan still will send me pictures of her favorite letters. She used to cut them out um, and she'll now either send me a picture on WhatsApp or just show it to me. Um, so it's it's so transferable and, and working on social media or newsletters, you kind of have that instant connection with your readers um, to get those comments back. Shares are really important as well. That obviously increases the reach of your articles. Um, and yeah, you just want to kind of create conversation within those spaces sparked by the journalism you're sharing um, and good and consistent engagement can attract more followers as well as keeping them on your platforms. Um, this then translate into brand recognition, website clicks and ultimately loyalty, like the higher you think of a news organisation the more likely you will go and read their stuff before anybody else, or you will get, get in touch with them with your own story. Like that's ultimately, you want to build those contacts and that's how people have done it in the past. And we can use social media to do that as well. Um, there's a picture on this, which is one of my favorite things of our newsletters is this little like, um, I don't know how to describe it, like a whammy bar of which way people vote. And this is from our TV letter from yesterday um, that's done by our TV editor. And it was kind of who's winning the war of the, the Roys because obviously Succession's back. Um, and I think at the moment, Kendall is winning on this little whammy bar voting platform. Um, but yeah, it's just another little extra engagement thing you can add in. We did something yesterday about the new BBC logo and just did a Twitter poll on which one, if people preferred the old one to the new one. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a really interesting way to understand your audience a bit further um, and also for them to feel heard and feel seen. That's always been a massive thing, I think. Um, and they also then like connecting with your journalists as well so if they follow your brand they then want to be able to have direct contact with journalists which twitter amazingly can do um, and is really good uh, for our audience to feel like they have that access there so my top audience tips hopefully this is transferable to everything you're doing obviously i think i'm gonna go through a, a lot of the questions and try and bring it down a bit um i realized I put this in and then I was like I feel like a lot of them aren't going to know what film this is from uh so this is from Dumb and Dumber for all the young people your parents probably really enjoyed it um go and watch it it's very silly um but it has been adapted into a meme here uh so top tips <laughs> you're like stop talking Tash give me the top tips uh cater to different audiences uh especially tailoring content on each social media platform um, how can you present it in different ways? Go watch my Instagram masterclass if you want to know how to do that more on Instagram. Um, whether it's topics um, or kind of the amount of posts you put up, acknowledge what works. Um, be led by audience data, but not consumed by it. Um, this is the kind of thing I was saying about brand versus audience. Acknowledge what works, but don't abandon what doesn't. Um, there will be a way that it works, and maybe that's something that needs to be changed. Um, in how you share it or actually something kind of pre-publication so you know next time actually you need to talk to that editor and say let's maybe tweak this slightly or let's lead it in on this because that was that was more interesting um but yeah stick to your brand identity and what you want to be known for um and yeah that's I think that's so important and that's really something that I've tried to emulate in growing the iSocial media brands um in terms of our Instagram page 
I was very much inspired by our newspaper, but our newspaper readers aren't necessarily our online readers. And it was just kind of keeping that tone and design really through our Instagram page, but still making it attractive and clickable and likable for that younger audience as well. Uh, and then finally, use those insights and data as a way to engage with your audience. Um, returning readers and viewers can be cultivated through that engaging content, as well as creating habits among when people can come back and see you or, or you can reach them as well. But yeah, I feel like I've whizzed through that, but I'm really, I'm hoping there's a lot of questions that I can kind of break down. Um, but yeah, of course there's a cat gif as well, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> of course there's a cat. Thank you very much, Tash. Um, uh, wow, so much stuff uh, you, 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 um, you've gone through there and I'm sure we want to unpick some of that. Uh, we've got a few questions already in the chat. If you've got any more questions, now is the time to put them into the chat. Um, a couple, just to begin with, maybe a couple of easier ones to start with, or well, not easy ones, but sort okay, of more, me more, more straightforward, I think, Tash. Um, so Claire, I mean, you, you've already, you, you've covered um, when to, when to post. Um, what about how often? Um, is yes. there anything, anything in terms of not being a stranger, but at the same time, not not absolutely cramming people's timelines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is another, that's another, if I had a pound for every time you're asked. Um, I think it depends on how much content you're producing. Um, and I think just kind of striking a balance between posting your strongest pieces and the pieces you want seen um, and spreading that out through the day or the week and when to put those out um, it's obviously different for each platform Facebook I would say we use it as a bit of a front front page for our socials so we always post our strongest pieces um, and we're slightly more selective with Facebook whereas Twitter will literally post every minute if we can um, and just get them out and we'll repeat posts with those um, there's no kind of impact from Twitter in terms of over posting uh, whereas with Facebook we they won't like that and then they'll be horrible to us and won't give us the reach <laughs> um, so it does vary in terms of platforms um, I think I'd kind of go back to my thing about consistency um, and just however much you're posting just be consistent about it if it's every other day um, do it every other day if it's just one day a week stick to that one day a week um, yeah, it does entirely depend. And just, and again, go back to kind of when your audience are online. If mo most of your readers are there kind of in the evening, um, then post them in the evening or just before. So there's a bit of a lead up time. Um, if most of them log on first thing, maybe post it kind of late at night um, and then they'll wake up to it and it'll be at the top of their feed. Um, it is kind of subjective. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't just give you a magic answer because I wish I had it as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that's really helpful. Thanks, Tash. Um, a couple about um, which platforms work best. So first of all, Paul saying or asking which platforms work best for political and social news slash commentary? Um, I would say, I would say for us it's Twitter, um, just in the cruder sense of what's best. Um, Twitter is our most effective just because that is the place where people will go to find news um, and also our politics newsletter. So everybody that has signed up to that has signed up to getting loads of pol politics to their inbox. Um, so they've kind of agreed to be that audience. Twitter very much again, people go to find that and they will be active kind of Twitter users wanting to be part of that conversation, wanting to know the latest news and politics. Um, Facebook, it's not really somewhere people go to find that. It's actually more of a case of it finds them and it's just whether they then engage with it, um, whether it does well. Um, if something does go big for us for in terms of politics on Twitter, we will then see a kind of trickle down effect onto Facebook because whoever's got wound up by it or really engaged with it on Twitter is then gonna go back and go, oh, I think all my followers on Facebook need to see this as well and then they'll actively share that across platform um, but I am of the opinion that you can make it work 
if that's your main focus, you can make that work across any platform. There are plenty of politics Instagram accounts. Um, there are plenty of politics TikTok accounts. Um, and as long as you focus on that and you are finding that audience for it, you can make it work. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, Tash. Uh, although I suppose, th th does some of the, I mean, if, if you, does some of this depend on who, who your audience is? I mean, you know, if it was a really young audience, you probably, I don't know, would you, would you still target Twitter? Um, probably not. No. Um, Twitter is a, a bit more kind of journalism based. So there's lots of journalists and an older audience. Whereas if you're trying, if you are trying to reach that younger audience, um, you do need to go to where they are. And that is Instagram and TikTok. Um, and it is about kind of catering to that audience. Um, you might it might not be being done at the moment it might be a vacuum and you might need to find a new way like the Washington Post have who I think are probably the most successful news brand on TikTok they've completely created a way of uh, presenting news um, to a TikTok audience and it might be that that's not been really cracked yet for a UK brand um, so yeah it is you've kind of if that's the audience that you want you've kind of got to go where they are and see what they like and interact with and see how you can tailor your your content to that okay thanks Tash um, uh, and then again on platforms Amina's asking uh, what platform is more suitable to grow a community audience and Amina says um, it's a community that is a, a local community uh, English isn't their first language so mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that, Tash? I would say um, one of the biggest tools for engagement on, on social media is um, Facebook groups. Um, and there was kind of a big surge in them a couple of years ago. It's kind of slightly died down in the last couple of years. Um, but they're, they're really good when Facebook was kind of focusing on that community drive. They wanted people to stop being horrible to each other and spreading fake news in their feeds. So they were like, everybody get in groups and be nice to each other. Um, and actually, I've previously worked as, as a local reporter and there was some of the local uh, Facebook groups that I was part of were invaluable for my local reporting. Um, just people putting up my cat stuck up a tree or, oh, I think somebody's just been arrested for murder up the road. And it's just they're, those like groups, they, they feel like a, they are a safe space if it's like a closed community um, and they are good for kind of sourcing um the news but also growing audiences as well um just because of the size of the team that we have at the eye we've not really been able to focus on it but i know other newsrooms have had huge success in it um a woman i previously worked with uh, grew a really successful um love island uh group uh last year um i know that there's also ones for like married at first sight it works really well and you just need that um very niche interest so not even doing one that's just who likes uk tv shows pick one and that's the specific audience you can then attract to that so um i would say even if english isn't their first language maybe that's something that can then bond them together and there are obviously tools within facebook to have a uh, foreign language within there um and there's also you can upload videos it doesn't just have to be um, word based it can also be video based and that sort of thing so just trial different methods as well within those platforms um, so yeah so Facebook groups is probably the thing that springs to mind around that um, newsletters again they're so they work so well when they're so specific um, we have a really good fantasy football newsletter that does really well for us um, and we've only just started our main kind of sports one um, but that fancy foot one does so well because it's so specific uh, and really kind of finding that kind of selling point and that really the specificity of it, that's where you're gonna create that audience around it and, and cater to them. Brilliant, thanks Tash. Um, I hope that's helped Amina. Um, and then a couple of career focused uh, questions, mm -hmm. uh, Tash, if you don't mind, um, any advice uh, this is from Nicole. Any advice for reporters who are interested in transitioning to an audience uh, so, or social Do role? it. Do it. <laughs> yeah, but how? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, that's what I did. So I was a news reporter uh, at local newspapers. Then I was a news reporter at national newspapers. Uh, and kind of when I was a local reporter, that was when they started doing social media and they were like, you, you're young, do this thing. Um, and that was kind of how I got into it. Um, but it's so, I love it now that people are actually choosing to do it and not just going, you're the youngest in the newsroom, do this thing. And then discovering you you like it, which is what I did. Um, but I think just if you're already in a newsroom, chat to the social media editor, um, look at how they change content into uh, social media posts or audience posts across kind of audience products. Um, yeah, I'd say just look out for kind of audience roles, social roles. It is difficult because every newsroom has a different title for kind of the same job. So when I was at Metro, we had social producers uh, and they were kind of the junior members of our, our social team. Whereas well, now that I'm at the Eye, we have our kind of junior members of our audience and social team are called audience executives. And it's not really transferable. So sometimes it gets a bit lost in translation, but just, I would say, don't be afraid to um, go for those roles and join those social teams and join those audience teams. Um, because I personally, as somebody who kind of grew up in journalism as a news reporter, um, you learn so many, so many key skills um that are completely transferable to creating that content to knowing that actually oh you shouldn't include that in an instagram post because that's against media law um and it's yeah there's so much transferable and and just give it a go if you're if you're freelance so i started off when i when i kind of transitioned from doing more social than news reporting i was freelance and my week was split between freelancing on a social desk and then also freelancing on a news desk um, and that really helped me realize what I actually really enjoyed doing. Um, and that was kind of a good way to balance it out and, and just message people like, um, most journalists love talking about themselves and love talking about what they've done, drop into their Twitter DMs and just be like, hi, I'm not asking you for a job. I would just like to kind of know if this is the right thing to do. Um, and they're all on Twitter. They've all got their nice pictures on there. They want, they want you to message them. So um, there's also lots of um, different groups that you can join. So like women in journalism um, and different kind of groups like that, that I know like forums that are really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, so just kind of reach out and, and try it. And don't, don't be afraid for it to, you might not be good at like video production, but you could be like banging at making Instagram designs and just absolutely smash that. So yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> and, if, and if you're maybe just at the very start of your career, um, mm -hmm. Ash, and you think, you know, I, I like what I've, you know, I've, I've heard today and uh, what Tash does, you know, that sounds really fascinating. I, I, lo I lo already love social media. Um, I mean, what what would your advice be? Would it still be to get a grounding in journalism um, and reporting first of all, and then move in that way? Or do you think it's possible to do this role, um, you know, fairly early on without having done much reporting yourself? I think it's now like so much easier to do this kind of audience job straight away because it's so much more of a like as you said in the in the like promo for this there's so many audience jobs going now it's finally being seen as a big part of newsrooms um so a lot of effort is going into not just hiring people that can already do this but training people up um and that's kind of what we're doing at the eye with our audience execs uh they're very young they're very like recent graduates um we're not only training them in audience but just kind of general newsroom and journalism as well from what they've already learned at university um and so i think the way i came up like a few years ago it was probably very beneficial for me to have that news reporting background however i do think now there is a lot more investment and a lot more kind of um trust in how important audience is so you will still get that training and the attention from people within newsrooms um to really kind of give you that grounding that maybe a year of news reporting would do as well um and but yeah it's either way no path in journalism is the same as anybody else's um it's just kind of what works for you um and and just try trial and error really 
Great, thank you, Tash. A, a few more here. Um, Alex has got a career with, I'm, I'm, Alex, you might need to give us a little bit more information here, but Alex is saying, at what point in your career should you start focusing down on a particular topic or beat? Is it better to be a journalist for the first couple of years? So I was thinking, okay, that maybe that's just a general career type question. But then Alex goes on to say, just conscious that if you spread yourself too thin and cover too many topics, you might not find or engage your core audience. So Alex, I, I wonder if you're, are you working as a freelance and you're thinking about building up your own audience? Um, uh, and if so, is it better to be a specialist or to be a generalist? I'm imagining a specialist. Yeah, Alex is a freelance. Well, uh, I'm just, I suspect it's to be a specialist because that's, it's, it's yeah. Um, but then she's worried about, um, sorry, Alex, I don't know if you're uh, he, she, they, um, pigeonhole, but worried about pigeonholing. Tash, over to you. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm right to answer this. Uh, well, I, I've been a health reporter, I've been a news reporter, I've been a video reporter, um, and now I kind of do everything. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of if you want to build that big following, um, I would say specialising and focusing on a specific topic is how you will grow an audience. Um, in terms of your own kind of personal development, it's kind of what is best for you and what you enjoy doing. Um, I think you can still be grow an audience with just kind of producing good content. Like our features writers and features editors at the Eye have big followings, um, and one week um, our features editor Rob could be talking about. Um, jewellery service and the important the fact that maybe actually there needs to be an or, an overhaul of jewelries in the UK court system and then last week he was on a freight train going up to Scotland and seeing about whether actually freight trains are the answer to the HGV crisis and I think just making sure you're kind of consistent in your posting um, and sticking with kind of this is the type of journalism I do it's long form it's in depth um, I think that can still be a specialism um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific topic. On the flip side, um, you can, if you do have a specialism, uh, you can really use that and hone that if you're building an audience. Um, someone who does that really well at the eye is uh, Will Hazel, our education correspondent. Um, he came from us from the education, I um, can't remember what it's called, TES? Uh, it's like the education uh, trade. Times educational, yep. Yes, that one. Um, and so he already kind of had like an educational following. He then consistently posts on social media about his education pieces. He will consistently have head teachers getting in touch with him saying, well, I think this and you should quote me in your piece or parents also know to get in touch with him. Um, so there's benefits to both sides. I think it's just kind of you need to do what's like true to you, really, is how I would approach it. Yeah, I mean, Simon Calder is another one, isn't he, on, on travel? Yes. Just comes, I suppose it comes back to what you've been saying before, Tash, about, you know, about brands and sticking to your brand. And if you know yourself what your own brand is, what it is that, you know, you bring that's unique or that people look to, or, you know, can look to you to, to, to give them, whether that's a specialism or, as you say, a type of, a type of journalism, then it's about being consistent with that, that brand uh, all the way through, isn't it? I mean, what... what, what question I had Tash for you was you know with someone like Will or Simon who have their own kind of brand how, how, do, how do when they do they do they post without um having to consult you I mean are you happy for that or yeah. I mean, how, does it, how does it work when reporters have their own audience um and and you're trying to sync that with with the eyes audience yeah so we kind of um we have kind of an interlocking like Twitter strategy in terms of I will always say to our reporters tweet your piece um when they come to me and say can this go on Facebook I'm like have you tweeted it and they're like no I'm like go do that um because it's instantly people care about other people on social media platforms they want to see that face they want to know who's sharing it um and actually they will trust a person more than a faceless kind of um uh, brand account they want to see someone they can engage with and go oh that's Will again he said this or our oh, oh, Hugo oh. so Hugo and um, Guy one of our political our politics editor now he became the vaccine correspondent during the pandemic every day at 2 p.m he'd post the 
vaccine numbers. So who had been vaccinated, what percentage of the country that was, how many first jabs had happened, how many second jabs had happened. He grew his following by I think about 10,000 people because he posted that every day at 2 p.m. I had people, not in journalism, just friends from like home texting me saying, when's when's Hugo doing his tweet? He's not done it yet. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't know, he's done this off his own back. Um, but he built that audience just by that consistency. Most, a lot of people then didn't even know that he worked at the iPaper. They just knew him as Hugo, the vaccine guy. Um, so there's, there's like lots of different ways to do it, definitely. Um, but yeah, I'd always say journalists should be sharing their own content. They shouldn't just be reliant on the social media team. That's not how it works anymore. Um, and it's not like six, seven years ago, you could open a Facebook account and open a start a Facebook page for a brand and have 100,000 followers within two months. That's not how it works anymore. You need to kind of work at it on a personal level. Um, and we've really seen that work in terms of growing our kind of brand image as well as our reporters themselves. Like there's also, um, it also helps to share across. So if a reporter at the eye tweets their story, I'll retweet them from the main account. We've got like 120,000 followers, that's going to give them a boost as well. Um, but it's also going to give us a boost because they're then going to follow those journalists and actually see the people behind our content. Um, also tweeting your, your colleagues' stories as well. If your best mate's just written a really good piece, share it. Like it's, it's really nice to see that kind of interchangeable and then that will then open up their audience to you and your audience to them. And it's kind of, you can all kind of work together. Thank you, Tash. Uh, I'm going to come uh, to Ross now. Ross will, will um, ask a question very early on uh, about newsletters. And Ross mm -hmm. has a newsletter for a non-profit brand. And he says, I've noticed that we're losing more subscribers than we're adding this year. What tactics would you try to, est um, to establish why that might be happening? How, how, how can you go about finding not just what, what's, what is working, but what's not working? Mm -hmm. I think I'd look at all the data as well so kind of click-throughs open rates have they fallen as well um looking at kind of the indication over time at when those kind of drop-offs happened um did something change in relation to the newsletter itself um in relation to how people are behaving i think we found we had so many people sign up to our newsletters last year when not a lot was going on um and then now these people are back at work and they've suddenly got 18 emails in their inbox every day. And they're unfortunately probably going through and going, well, I don't follow that anymore. Don't need that anymore. Um, and they can probably actually watch the news again. I think that was another big thing is kind of what I said earlier about people not actually wanting to watch the news briefings. Um, people can, can kind of watch the, the news again now. And it is because it's not kind of um, death stats every day like it kind of stacking up was I mean that's what it is but it's not as intense and I think people were far more okay with kind of being second to content rather than first and getting to that breaking news they were okay with it kind of reaching them and them not going to look for it um but yeah I think there's a lot of things to kind of look at and and whether you try kind of changes in format we've just done that recently with our newsletters we kind of did a whole kind of refresh and redesign um, and kind of people may have got gotten used to not clicking on it because they kind of see it and it kind of looks the same every day and just giving it that refresh and then clicking on it going oh this was that newsletter I wasn't clicking on because it looked a bit like oh it wasn't what I like but actually that looks really interesting um so I think just a just have a dig into whatever I'm not sure whatever data you have what is working what isn't um, and just maybe have a think of other ways you can push stuff through engagement we found works really well in newsletters can you start off with engagement to encourage people to open it and stay signed up um, and yeah that's probably all I have to offer on that I think okay thank you I hope that uh, that helps Ross um, and then just a couple of more existential <laughs> questions from Sean and Chris um, Tash, um, Chris is asking, is there a danger that going for engagement determines the news agenda and you end up telling your audience more about what they like to know, not what they need to know? Sure. Um, I think 
Yeah, I think it's just a balance, it definitely is. Um, and that's kind of what I was saying about kind of sticking with the brand as well as what your audience wants. Um, and there is obviously a risk of that and it's whether that works for you, whether you want to do it. Um, but I think it is just about striking that balance and it might be that actually your like referrals aren't doing that great in a week. So maybe actually if you just upped your engagement a bit and kind of played into what people want they might kind of come back to you a bit more on on click throughs it's kind of a give and take thing um yeah I think it is about balance I think it's not about going over the top and and just kind of sticking to what works it's kind of challenging it as well and and just trialing different methods okay thank you um Tash and and Sean's asking how do you see social media changing in the next five years and what impact will that have on the journalism we do? I mean, um, you know, we, you've talked about how you're constantly having to adapt with new algorithms and, and new uh, features. Um, uh, but I mean, do you get a sense of what way we're moving in and how that might change the way we well, the way we do our journalism, but but also just the way we share it and the way we we, we tell our stories. Yeah, definitely. Um, I kind of don't want to say it out loud, but I uh, think the the death of Facebook is incoming, possibly, mm. potentially. Um, I hope Facebook's not listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Please still give me referrals. Um, uh, yeah, I think that is going to be the biggest change. It's already a platform it's not growing uh people aren't there aren't new people signing up to facebook there aren't new people liking uh news organizations facebook pages um it's going to be about kind of taking our dependency off facebook and going to other platforms which i've tried to gradually do um in the last couple of years and going to kind of new and emerging platforms for news like obviously instagram isn't new but it's new for news um, I only really started getting used for news a few years ago um, and actually that's that's something that more publishers will shift to um, other tools they can use I mentioned earlier about Twitter moments they've become such a big thing and actually the news tab on Twitter is becoming more prominent um, as well as there's a news tab now on LinkedIn um, and that gets used quite a bit I also think there will be a shift to a focus on kind of loyal audiences and actually not just news organisations recognising those loyal audiences, but people wanting to be them. So more kind of subscriber, subscriber based websites um, and more kind of exclusivity and getting kind of in those conversations. Um, I think there's still lots of potential to do lots of fun things like videos and, and changing and adapting as we go. Um, and it's not the end of social media yet. There might be a day there is, um, but it's it's not yet. I think the next five years are just kind of gonna be, we're kind of clued up to what social media is now. Like the everyday person knows what social media is, knows who Mark Zuckerberg is and knows all the scary things that are happening. Um, and I think it's from there is gonna be kind of the turning point in whether actually people want to use that or they want those products like newsletters that they feel they can trust more than scrolling through a Facebook feed um, or scrolling through Twitter. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I see it shifting. And, and for news organizations, is it just about just trying to spin all those plates, you know, even- With even, audience editors. Even, even those that we don't think have a future, just keep on spinning them because we just never know. And is that yeah. essentially the trick? Yeah, definitely. I think just kind of keeping up as much as you can um, and just seeing kind of where they go and admitting defeat, but kind of if you can keep it ticking over with as little effort, then that's maybe what you do. Um, and yeah, doing it that way, I think. Wow, well, thank you, Tash. I mean, that, that's, that's um, been really insightful and um, thank you for that kind of forecast as well. It just gives us a little Don't bit tell of tell Facebook I said that. A little bit of a stink. Well, they're, cha they're changing their name, aren't they? Did, did, did I begin yes. this morning? They're going to change their name? Yeah, it... I don't know what it's going to be, so I don't have that inside so, uh, knowledge. Uh, suggest that perhaps that they are aware, well, I'm sure they're aware um, of the challenges that lie ahead for them. Um, well, Tash, thanks so much uh, for, for being willing again to share your time and your 
your knowledge and your expertise um, with us today. So uh, thank pleasure. you very much. Just a quick comment from <clears throat> Terry here says, thank you, Tash. My understanding of audience has completely uh, changed as a business owner. I can now imagine how to change my loyal audiences and see them as potential long-term consistent and constant customers and clients okay. of my business. So um, there we go. That's um, great feedback. So thank you very much uh, audience for joining us.